Okay. All right. So my name is John Albert, and I'm a vehicle systems engineer on the Corvette team. My responsibility is the chassis and thermal part of the vehicle. So that includes anything on the dirty side of the car, on the wheels, the suspension, the steering, the powertrain cooling, the air conditioning system. I personally was involved in the designing of the powertrain cooling system. So I was asked to get up and talk about what we did to cool this beautiful engine and make this thing sing on the, on the, on the track. So, a couple things that I want to talk a little bit about with the Z51 and even the base car that isn't obvious to we, the casual observer when you're looking at the engine or looking at the vehicle. Or even when you look at the suction vehicle that we have here under the tent. The way that the cooling system works, the way that it flows, is that it comes out of the engine hot, moves towards the front of the vehicle, splits off, and goes to the two radiators in the front corners. Those radiators see the same coolant at the same time. We call that parallel. And the reason why we do that, if anybody's familiar with resistance in electrical, if you put two resistors in series, you sum that resistance. If you put them in parallel, it's the inverse of the sum. So that's what we did to reduce the restriction of the radiator. Now on the, on the base, on the base LT2 Stingray, we have 28 millimeter thick radiators. When we step up to the Z51 for track purposes, we make those two radiators from 35 millimeter thick. When the cooler comes out of those two radiators, it's joined back together and heads down the tunnel. When it hits the engine, it goes into the water pump, and the water pump energizes the coolant, sends approximately 85% of the coolant into the engine, and sends 15% of the coolant to two pipes on either side of the water pump. One goes out to the engine oil cooler, which is a plate cooler, and a plate is literally as it would, you would think, it's a series of plates with alternating oil and coolant to cool the engine oil of the LT2. On the right hand side, we send the coolant out to a cooler in that opening, which we refer to as an aux rad, and commonly we refer to it as a step down, because what we do with the coolant in that aux rad on the right hand side of the vehicle is we cool the coolant down one more time to bring it down to a lower temperature. And the reason why we do that is because the transmission on the track needed lower temperature oil than what a typical transmission would use. So we had to do that to get the coolant down to where we needed it so the oil would operate at the optimum for track use. We could have done it in the front, but it would have been the Stingray Mac instead of the Stingray, because the front radiators would have been huge. So now, as we step up to the Z06, of course, you go from 495 horsepower of an LT2 to 670 horsepower of the LT6. So what we had to do was we had added, obviously, more cooling capability. The Z06 over the Z51 has a 50% increase of cooling capacity. And the way that we accomplish that is by basically increasing airflow as well as adding radiators. So first, let's talk about adding radiators. You put a radiator here in the center. That radiator does a lot of work because it's at the stagnation point of the airstream of the vehicle. So we added a radiator here, and we also added a radiator on the left-hand side of the vehicle that now feeds the engine oil cooler on the LT6. So the aux rads in the back have very specific uses. The one on the right always feeds coolant to the transmission. The one on the left always feeds coolant to the plate cooler on the engine. So we increased, not only we went from three radiators to five, but we also increased the airflow to remove the heat from those heat exchangers because ultimately it's the air that cools the engine. We put heat in the coolant, the coolant then puts the heat in the air, that's how we cool down the engine. So the way we accomplished that is that we moved, or not moved, I'm sorry, but the fans up front, we increased their power from 300 to 450 watts. So a 50% increase in wattage of the front fans. We also increased the side openings to increase the airflow by 20%. So pretty much that's how we got that capability. The question was, how much more drag does that create? Um, 
The aerodynamic team is part of the development of a vehicle with a very interesting balance between what we call in the powertrain cooling area front end airflow. Front end airflow is a term used for how much airflow we need through the heat exchange. The aerodynamic team talks about aerodynamic drag, CD, and so forth, lift, those type of things. This vehicle, because of the downforce that they were trying to achieve for the purpose of cornering with the downforce, I think this one has, a, uh, I shouldn't quote Air Force, because uh, Aero, because I'm not an Aero guy. But the Aero people don't like the powertrain cooling guys, because we make their car drag here to make it more powertrain cooling capable. Um, in terms of the amount of drag, it's been quantified. Dave Caples and the team have shown me, you know what you cost me? And yes, I do. I don't know the number because I forget it, because all I care about is that I've set an objective, we did this for the Corvette, the C8, and I think this is a huge accomplishment for the program. Our objective was to run this car at 100 degrees F with the air conditioning on at 72C, uh, 72F for the interior and race it on the track. And we were able to achieve that with the Z51 and with the Z06. So, do you have a question? Both sides have fans. Yep. In fact, thank you for reminding me. One thing I want to mention is that the C8 Corvette has four fans. It doesn't matter whether it's a, a Stingray, a Z51, or a, a Z06. It always has four fans. The two fans in the back are part of our reuse strategy to make these cars the price, the amazing price that it is. We reuse parts that we've already engineered. So if you look at a C7 on the Z06 and at the small fan that was in the back for the differential cooler, that fan is what we use in the back here. I put a different shroud on it, but it's the same fan. The fans that we have up here is the same fan and motor that we originally used on the Volt, which is kind of surprising, but it was just perfectly off the shelf for me to go grab and use. The shroud is unique for the Corvette, but it was the same one. Um, one thing that's very interesting to know is that the fans in the back and the fans in the front are controlled independently. And what controls them, and I can't remember the, all the uh, pieces that go into it, but there's like seven parameters that the development engineer who calibrates that uses to turn the fans on the back. Things like exhaust temperature, motor compartment temperature, coolant temperature, oil temperature, uh, I don't remember the other ones, how he feels. But the main thing is, is that he can turn those fans on or not turn those fans on depending on what's happening with the rest of the car. Yes? What amp? Uh, you know, it was a discussion. We got onto it uh, because we increased the wattage of the fans. So it changed the wiring that we used in that area. But in terms of the alternator and the amp, does anybody from the Corvette team know, did we change the alternator or anything, or what the amp size is for the alternator? I don't know that off the top of my head. If anybody knows it, shut it out. If not, I'll find out. Come back later and I'll answer that question. Okay, I'll get that for you. You have a question? Yes, I'm curious, like, how do you have to The question is, is how difficult is it to service the system if you have to bleed the system? The Z06 is no different than the Z51. It's a challenge. Now, we've been working this system and we just literally, uh, with, a, with a new engineer, spent some time trying to figure out how to get the service time down on that service bill. It is a significant challenge to service fill this car, no doubt. Um, and it's because of the complexity of the plumbing where we had to put radiators all over the place. And it is difficult. No, there's no electric water pumps on this vehicle. There's only the mechanical driven one. Uh, we, don't, we didn't put anything in there. There's no need for it. Uh, basically, in terms of the service fill, it's a matter of using the bleeds up front, uh, knowing when to what we, you know, uh, purge the system, if you will, use an evac and fill system, and then fill it in. Yes. Yep. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention, because there was a couple questions earlier and I wanted to bring it up, because I know there's been a lot of dialogue about it, there's probably somebody been asked already, is that uh, here on the display we have a stone guard 
that is now available as an option. And I want to explain those film guards and I want to explain the radiators are fun. Technically what you see when you look at the front end of the car, those aren't actually radiators on the left hand and the right hand side. Those are condensers. The radiators are behind them. Radiators are made out of very thin metal that's called folded tube technology. We roll the tubes over and braze them. The material that the radiator is made out of is, is ten thousandths of an inch thick and it's aluminum so it's very soft. Those radiators are never designed to see the first air. What's always designed to go in front of them are the condensers. The condensers are used for the AC system, and that's what you actually see. Now the difference of an AC system and a condenser is those condensers use what's called extruded technology. So if you've ever used with Play-Doh, you squeeze it through that shape. You do the same thing with the aluminum. The key there is it allows you to build structure in that tube and what we call a uh, bullnose technology where we thicken the leading edge of the tube instead of ten thousandths of an inch is thirty thousandths of an inch. And that design was really developed empirically over time with warranty that we've received from failures in the field. And we developed a validation test and made sure that it works. So we created this really violent validation test for our suppliers that they have to show us that their condenser tube can pass this test before it gets to go on the front end of the vehicle. Now the radiators that do see air directly, that don't have condensers, is the center one and the ones in the back. Those happen to be made out of condenser tubes, and that was done intentionally. The one in the center is actually a thicker tube, I believe it's 43 thousandths of an inch thick bull nose instead of the 30 thousandths of an inch bull nose. So when you see a radiator, quote unquote radiator, the actual condenser, that has what appears to be damaged, what you're seeing are the fins that transfer the heat out of the tube to the air. The fins are super, super thin. They're three thousandths of an inch thick, and they're in a zigzag. Those fins are made out of, you know hot rodders put the fins on a hood? You do the same thing with the, the fins. And it's made to make the air very uh, turbulent, slow it down, so the air has a chance to pick up the heat and move it out the back side. So when you dent one from a stone head, stone impingement is what we call it, you actually don't lose the performance because the thing is so restricted to begin with that its performance is still there. It's more of an aesthetic thing. So because we had people express concern, didn't like the way it looked, we worked with the supplier and we came up with that design. Uh, we went through a couple of iterations because they kept throwing designs. They said, nope, too restricted, no too restricted. We got down this one. It does remove airflow about one CMM per side. Unless you're going to track the car, it really won't affect you. If you do track the car, I put in the owner's manual that if you add this option to your vehicle and you're going to track the car on a day that's above 90 degree F, take them off. Other than that, you're good. Any other questions? Oh, one thing that I wanted to just remind myself, uh, one thing that I'm super excited about with the, it's kind of tied to the powertrain cooling and the condensers. When we went to the LT6 engine, uh, the engine RPM, as you guys know, is crazy high, like 8,600 RPM compared to the LT2. Now, we have compressor RPM limits that prevent the RPM from going too high. So I can't have the same pulley ratio and spin the compressor higher than it does on the LT2. So what we had to do is change the pulley ratio of the AC compressor from 1.57 to 1.028. And the key is, is that at redline for the LT2 and at redline for the LT6, the compressor is spinning the same RPM, which allows you to go back to my original statement of what our requirement, our objective was, was to be able to run this car on the track in 100 degrees F with the AC on set to 72 degrees. So to keep the AC compressor spinning, keeps it running, keeps it working, keeps it cool. The way that I affect it by slowing down the compressor, you lose your AC performance at idle. The way I adjust it for that is that the LT2 AC compressor is a 140cc six cylinder compressor. The LT6 has a 170cc seven cylinder compressor. And in our validation test of the Z51 and the Z06, the Z06 AC performance is actually just a little bit better. I don't know that you as a human being will notice the difference, but in our measured data, we actually see that the Z06 actually outperforms the Z51 from AC. Cool, yes sir. 
Summertime. Oh, summertime tires. Um, I'm not a summertime expert, but I can try and answer the question. What's your question? What's the use? Temperature range? Oh, okay. The question is, why do they call a summertime tire a summertime tire? There's literally different rubber compounds that are used for summer temperatures versus a winter tire, which is designed specifically for winter temperatures, versus an all-season radial, which is designed for all temperatures. Now, one of the things that I do want to emphasize, and Jeff, do you remember the temperature for summertime tires? What's it say in the manual to pull summer tires off? 45 to 50? Okay. So we say 40, thank you, I'm getting another confirmation. 45 degrees F, if you're driving the car in 45 degrees F or lower, you don't want your summertime tires on there. And there's two reasons. One is it's a safety issue, but tires don't perform very well and you will lose traction much easier. There is a financial reason, it will actually damage your tires. You take a summertime tire, you drive it out in the wintertime, 30 degrees F, 10 degrees F, you will literally crack the rubber. It's a bad deal. So summertime tires are literally designed for that temperature and they perform amazing compared to an all season for that reason. On the flip side, if you have a summertime tire on your car and you want to drive your car in the wintertime, you need to get some all season radials, but like my development engineers that I work with all the time, like, oh, you got to put winter tires on. It's amazing the difference. So if you're going to flip back and forth and you're going to drive it all year, my recommendation is definitely put on the winter tires to drive it. Basically, October to April, depending where you go. Yeah. Uh, you talk about the transmission and the dip, and the reason I asked that, I had a uh, CTSV coupe, I lived okay. in Europe, drove it to the motorcycle quite often, nice. and I had to place, replace the uh, rear dip, and they said it wasn't built for the high speeds like that, and, and the cooling, there was a, some kind of cooling issue, is what the dealer told me. Um, so does this have an improved cooling on the dip and transmission? Well, the dip and the transmission in this is one and the same. It's all cooled together. So he was, the question was asking about, you've got a CTSV, and was concerned about the diff on that CTSV, and was asking about the diff on the electronic differential on the Corvette, and if it's got better cooling than the diff on the CTSV. Completely different transmission, different diff. The differential and the transmission are one and the same on the Corvette across all models, and the cooling that we provide with the Oxrad cools the diff and the trans because it's all the same oil. So yes, we are in great shape. We, one of the, the things that we do to validate your Corvettes, and we there are hundreds of tests that we conduct, but one of the things that is our benchmark for us is we run these things on the track for 24 hours. And it's, we literally run it until the tank is empty, we pull in the garage, do it, you know, we check things, we look at things, fill the tank back up, put it back out on the track run it for 24 hours. We just literally spent some time in Germany with one of our versions of our cars, and it was 97 degrees F, because it was they had a heat wave in Germany, and we ran the car for multiple tanks, and all the powertrain cooling vitals were excellent, spot on, exactly what we wanted. I'm like dancing, I'm like, yeah, yeah. So I was super geeked. We do not have that issue with the DCT. We are super robust to cool. Anything else? Yes, sir. On the radiators that are down low, is GM going to offer a track screen? Is that little pebbles, like any type of screen that would go on those radiators? Yeah, the question is about the screens. I think you missed the discussion earlier. We got this option now, and you can use those. It does help to reduce the amount of debris that you get inside. So you're, you're good. Yep. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, we don't have screens on the side yet. We haven't really seen the need for it as of yet. Um, but, you know, we get feedback that you guys find you want them. You don't recommend Sorry? You don't recommend them. question is, do I recommend screens on the side? Uh, I don't think you need them. You know, it's we validated that to a stone intention test. It was pretty violent. I think I was mentioning earlier, we've, we've had very good success. Um, so from a damage standpoint, we haven't seen anything yet. One more question. The, uh, 
One more. The oil. Yeah. Is there a forwarding for this? Say it again? Is there a forwarding oil that you have made by Noble? Oh, okay. The engine oil? Do you have to make that available to the app? Oh, uh, whether the oil for the Z06 is available for the marketplace over the counter. I am not powertrain fueling. That's the, sorry. I'm not powertrain. I don't know. And I don't know. I see if Jeff's browser is around or Tim Campbell or I think the program team, the, the leadership is not here. Come back later. I'll get that answer. Okay. Anything else? Anything else? Anything else? Come on. I love this stuff. Yeah, I'm not good, I don't know. Oh, one thing, that, since, you know, you guys haven't asked me a question, I want to throw a little tidbit, things that I'm excited about, that as an engineer, these are boring tidbits, but they're exciting as an engineer. The radio that's on the left-hand side and back is the same radio that's on the right-hand side and back. We were able to design that so it uses the same part. The same literal fan shroud that's on the left-hand side is the same fan shroud that's on the right-hand side. The same fan shroud up front is the same fan shroud on the right hand side. These are little trivial things, but as an engineer, I get super excited about that because that's success to me, and that's how we keep costs down, that's how we make these things work. Like I was mentioning about the compressors, the 140cc compressor for the Z51 and the LT2, and the LT6 uses the 170cc compressor. They share the same clutch. So your dealer only has to carry one compressor pulley flash, not two. And it's a big deal for space and cost. Clarify, Mark. The oil comes out of the engine, can it get spilled Not the oil. The question is, does the oil come out of the engine? The engine, one of the things that we found as part of our trend with the internal motors, this is, this is common across all of GM. This is something we've learned over time, is we want to keep oil inside the thing that uses it. We like not to send it out if we don't have to. So the engine oil stays in the engine. The transmission oil stays in the transmission. That's why you'll see a plate cooler on the transmission and you'll see a plate cooler on the engine. We send coolant to that glycol, to that, to that plate cooler, and then the coolant is brought to the radiators and that's how the heat is changed. It comes forward from the engine, splits, comes back together, goes back down, goes into the engine and a percentage, a large percentage, 85% of it goes into the engine to start cooling the engine and then 15% gets split to the, aux, to the aux rads on the sides to then cool those individual plates. Yep. And then it's brought back together. There's something you, when you were asking that question, it reminded me of something I wanted to mention about the cooling system and I don't remember what it was. Maybe it'll Anything else? Anything else? Rise up itself. I don't know much about it other than the fact that there's scavenger pumps that run all along the rail of the motor because in each chamber that represents two cylinders in the other area, in each area, uh, there's a scavenger pump that pulls the oil up, puts it into the tank. Thank you. Is that why we have to check the oil while running? Honestly, I don't know. The question is, is that how we have to change the oil? Uh, I, I mean, check the engine oil, I don't know. Not sure how it works. But probably, it makes sense. Yeah, anything else? Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for listening.